we're going to talk about driving ergonomics today and highlight some of the different issues and challenges associated with driving, physically what happens to your body when you drive. And then we're going to address uh, some ways that you might be able to keep yourself and your employees safer uh, if they drive for significant amounts of time while they're at work. So driving is harmful because the ligaments in your back that help hold your spine together, those stretch over the time that you spend seated in the vehicle. And that's even more compounded by the fact that you're experiencing vibration the entire time you're in your vehicle. Um, and so what happens is that those stretch over time. And then when we stand again, our spine still needs because that stretch occurs and it happens for a period of time, when you stand, you still need those ligaments to come back into position. It's not like they snap back instantly. They take a while to uh, to come back into position. And so that's one of the reasons that people find uh, sitting and driving particularly harmful is that we our spine is not fully supported when we're sitting. Um, and that's even prob more problematic when we don't actually properly adjust our vehicle. That uh, poorly adjusted seats can create pressure points. They can... Uh, create awkward back postures or awkward neck postures that could potentially be avoided with better positioning. Other things that cause uh, harmful driving effects are continuous muscle activity to hold your head and neck in position. And this is particularly problematic with people who have a forward head posture. We need to be cautious of that. Um, and that can be aggravated while you're in your vehicle as well. And then anytime that you have to operate the foot pedal or the brake or even your clutch, if you drive a manual vehicle, that foot pedal operation can cause imbalances in your leg and your back. Uh, so sometimes your back muscles will actually be imbalanced. And then you all obviously are also applying pressure, which can create some stiff and discomfort. In the, U in the UK, they've even gone so far as to coin the term repetitive driving injury, and they consider uh, injuries that are related to driving to be things like foot cramps, low back pain, stiff neck, and shoulder pain. And the shoulder pain I haven't really addressed yet, but that's uh, probably, as you would imagine, is associated with holding onto that steering wheel and the postures that are required to do that. So some back injury risk factors, uh, probably the biggest factor for driving is your posture, right? The posture that you're in, the amount of time that you spend in that vehicle. So if you are driving to and from work and it takes you maybe an hour or so to get in and out, um, and then you experience constant vibration from driving, right? You're constantly uh, bouncing around a little bit from the vibration of the, of the road. Those three things combined are going to really increase your risk of injury. The estimate is that if you, uh, your back injury risk is increased two to four times if you drive greater than 30 kilometers in a day and there are a lot of folks in the GTA where we're located here that do drive more than 30 kilometers to get to work right live in the suburbs come in now that's even further compounded if you have someone who drives uh, for their job right you have someone who is a salesperson driving around to different locations different sites perhaps you have a delivery vehicle of some kind those people are going to be in the car way more than 30 kilometers in a day and probably way more than 30 kilometers in single occasion we which creates additional uh, additional problems. As I mentioned on the previous slide, that vibration is one of the major risk factors here. That the problem with vehicle vibration is that it actually occurs in the exact same plane that your spine is in. So obviously when you're sitting in the vehicle, your spine is upright and that vibration is bouncing that spine up and down. So that creates a lot of muscle fatigue because your back and neck muscles are really working hard to keep that spine in place and then they're constantly contracting and relaxing to hold that spine uh, in position. So that creates a lot of fatigue and increases our injury risk. Things like bumpery terrain, poor alignment of your vehicles, poor shocks, seating that doesn't have good support any longer, including pro improper posture in the vehicle, all of those things are going to increase the risk associated with vibration exposure. So I can't always change the terrain that I'm in, uh, but I can do good things like uh, pay attention to vehicle maintenance and alignment uh, and work on making sure I'm replacing vehicles on a regular basis to make sure that I'm fully supported while I'm in the vehicle, at least uh, minimizing this risk as much as I can. So when you are sitting in your vehicle, uh, we've already talked about this a little bit, but spinal curve is distorted typically. So you can see there in the two pictures I have at the top, the person on the left has that natural S curve shape of their spine and the person on the right basically has lost the curvature, right? They have a significant curve, but it's in the wrong direction. There is not that sort of comeback of that natural S curve. And so the spinal curve becomes distorted um, and then that is going to increase your muscle fatigue because now the loading of your spine has become 
become imbalanced. So in particular, your low back and your upper back are going to be uh, are going to be pro are at greater risk. They're going to be more uncomfortable. And then we add the vibration components, which you always already talked about how that weakens your muscles and that creates additional problems. So sometimes we even add stress to that, right? We know that driving isn't easy, especially when you're in traffic areas or you know, you find you're not someone who finds driving very comfortable. Um, then stress may add uh, to postural issues. When we sit in a vehicle, we want to push our butt right back to the back of the seat and sit equally on both on both buttocks. And the real reason here is that you want to maintain that balance. Imbalance means that your spine is going to increase or see fatigue even faster because certain muscles are going to be stretched further than others. Your spine is meant to be up and down and vertical. So if your wallet is under one cheek or if you have pants pockets, uh, items in your pant pockets that cause you to sit sort of strangely, then we're going to have more issues, uh, potentially posturally related, and certainly more issues with, uh, with contact stress or press pressure points caused by those items. When we're driving, we want to keep our shoulders down and our arms relaxed. So 10 and 2 is not a bad position, but it does cause us to reach forward quite far. You might even consider driving at 9 and 3 or a little bit lower than that. You're still going to have two points of contact. You're still going to uh, be able to manage the vehicle quite well, but it allows you to neutralize that shoulder postures by dropping them down a little bit. You want to stretch the top of your head upwards, so sitting tall, and keep your chin tucked in so that your uh, your chin is slightly down and your eyes are looking far down the road. That's also going to help you with uh, a better head and neck position while you're in the vehicle. So let's talk briefly about adjusting the driver's seat and controls. Let's look at each one of these individually. So the first point I have there is seat height. You want to raise your seat up as high as you can and still be comfortable. So you want to do that by making sure you have room between the roof and the top of your head. You never want to have a contact point up there in case of emergency. There should definitely be some space there. But if your seat is nice and high, you're actually going to do a better job of aligning your hips and your knees probably and create a better viewing angle to look out of your windshield and over the, over the hood of your car. So raise your seat up as high as possible to still be comfortable. And then look at seat cushion depth. Some vehicles have this feature, some don't, but uh, you may be able to actually adjust this, the depth of the seat cushion. So the depth of the seat between the edge of the front edge of the seat and the actual backrest is what I'm talking about here. So you want to adjust it to ensure that two or three fingers of space are exist between the back edge of your seat and the back, of, or excuse me, the front edge of your seat and the back of your legs. You never want to have your legs uh, rubbing or resting against the back of that seat. It typically it creates some discomfort and can impact uh, circulation in the long term. You want to look at seat uh, forwards, so sliding the seat forwards and backwards. You want to make sure that you can fully reach the pedals, and you should be able to use your entire foot and fully depress the pedal. So you don't want to just be able to reach it and get it down slightly. You want to be able to fully depress that pedal with your entire foot, not just your toes. Whenever possible, your heel should be supported on the floor. So there are times that that's not going to be realistic. But enough, if you can support your heel on the floor, then you're not lifting that leg, therefore not putting additional strain on the hips and the back to lift the weight of your leg off the ground. And your knee should always be slightly bent. So even when you push that pedal all the way down, you want to have a slight bend in your knee. Just it ensures you have easy access to all the pedals. It maintains that nice soft knee. You're never going to be stretching with your toes, which is likely going to slide that hip away from the, uh, the backrest and create a more awkward back posture. When you look at seat cushion angle, it's if possible, try and create a backwards incline. So what we mean by that is that it's actually a little bit higher at the back than at the front. Now, the reason we do this is to reduce pressure points and again, align those hips and those knees a little bit better. You wanna make sure that those two things are in, in line as best as possible. If your knees are higher than your hip, that becomes a very difficult position for people who have low back injuries, just because some ligaments and things that run over your buttocks and into the back of your legs are quite stretched in that posture. So being more in line is actually a much more comfortable position for most individuals. And a lot of vehicles do have this feature that you can actually jack up the back edge of the chair a little bit to create a more neutral position. 
Then you want to look at your seat backrest angle. So your backrest angle should be approximately 100 to 110 degrees, and that's going to reduce the stress on your lower back. So you're going to be able to, you're not, I mean, we used to say everyone sits up perfectly 90 degrees. Reality is that people don't actually sit that way. If I put you up at perfectly 90 degrees, eventually you're going to start slouching forwards and leaning over the, over the steering wheel, and that's not what we want. We want you to actually use the backrest and get the support that's present in that backrest. So we're looking at an angle of about 100 to 110 degrees. And this is probably determined uh, a little bit based on your size uh, and your reach and things, but also based on your vehicle size. So a small vehicle, uh, one that's low to the ground, and has a smaller windshield. So you may find that an actual slightly increased angle will create a better viewing posture. You'll actually be able to see more of the road uh, as well as more uh, like further out over the hood of your vehicle. And perhaps a, a taller vehicle that you can sit up a little bit more upright in that has more headroom you may find 100 degrees is actually more than suitable for viewing positions. Probably one of the most important uh, parts of any seat, and in particular uh, a vehicle seat, and we're talking about uh, uh, talking about um, uh, vibration as well, you want to adjust the lumbar support if your vehicle has it. Now, not all vehicles have this feature for certain, and it doesn't seem to depend on uh, price or quality, perceived quality of a vehicle. A vehicle that is relatively inexpensive may have lumbar support, and a vehicle that is uh, very expensive may not. And so it's an interesting feature to look for uh, when you're shopping around for vehicles. Trying to get lumbar support adjustment in your vehicle can allow you to, uh, to reduce that lower back fit fatigue and lower back discomfort if it's something you're experiencing. So you want to adjust that support up and down and in and out if you can, and you want to be sitting up nice and tall while you're doing this. So your lumbar should fit comfortably in the curve of your lower back. So when you're sitting up tall, you should feel that natural S curve where it sort of caves back in at the lower part of your back, and you want this uh, this lumbar support to be positioned directly in that space. That creates the most uh, support for your lower back while you're seated. In terms of your steering wheel, these are some other features that you have the flexibility to adjust. So you want to tilt your steering wheel so the airbag's pointed right at your chest, not at your head or your neck. Certainly we don't want our air, airbag deploying in that position. And then if you have the option to telescope your steering wheel, you want to adjust the distance of that to approximately 12 inches from your chest. Now, that is a Canadian uh, measurement. I believe they are different in the U.S. So if you're viewing this from the U.S., you may want to look at their standards. I believe the standard there is 10 inches, but you'll have to double check that. Uh, but in Canada, it's approximately 12 inches from your chest. And you want to ensure that you can reach the wheel with your elbows slightly bent. All right, so that's the goal. Elbows slightly bent, soft elbows about 12 inches away and you want to be able to comfortably reach the wheel. And then last uh, piece here is the head restraint. You want to adjust the head restraint. It, it's, it's a safety mechanism for your vehicle uh, that not everyone realizes or knows how to adjust properly. So you want to adjust the height of the headrest so it's in line with the top of your head. And if you have that option, you want to adjust the angle so that the restraint is one or two inches from the back of your head while driving. So you can see in the diagram I've got there uh, that when they're nice and close to the headrest, there, your head is not going to snap backwards very far during during an accident or in case of emergency. If you someone who sits with a forward head posture, or perhaps your vehicle, you sit a little further away from your vehicle seat because you have an obus form or something in there in your back, you may find that your head is a little bit too far away from your uh, your headrest. And so in that case, if you can adjust the angle so that it comes a little bit closer to you, um, or if you're talking about just having a forward head posture, work on improving your, your vehicle posture, and that should bring that head back a little bit. So improving your lower back posture will actually bring your head back a bit as well. And then obviously in the third diagram there, the third image, the headrest is actually quite a bit lower than uh, is ideal for that person's head height. They're not going to get a lot of support there. There's going to be a lot of movement before they hit the headrest uh, in that posture. So next we're going to talk about briefly is entering and exiting the vehicle and how to do that safely because uh, there are some specific techniques depending on the type of vehicle you have that can improve this and make it a little easier for those folks who have uh, already existing back discomfort. So in order to exit the vehicle forwards, they call this one forwards, you're going to actually swing your legs out. So as this woman in the diagram is doing, she's swinging one leg out and then we're going to slide the other one out and actually turn to fit sideways in the seat. And you want to make sure that your feet are fully planted on the ground before you exit the vehicle. 
you're going to use the vehicle to your advantage, right? You you have a, a door there. There's also some different positions to the left and the right where you can actually use your hands to help support your body weight as you climb out of the vehicle. So you're actually going to turn sideways and use the vehicle to support your body weight uh, or partially support your body weight with your hands and arms while you climb out. So to do that, you're going to bend at the hips quite, uh, you're going to bend at the hips, keeping your back nice and straight, and then also bend at your knees, and then pull yourself sort of into that upright position. And you always want to maintain three points of contact. And that's true for exiting forwards as well as exiting backwards. And now I'm using the term exiting here, but this could also apply to entering uh, the vehicle. And in this case, you could actually enter the vehicle butt first, right? That you could support the weight of your body with the sides of the vehicle, turn sideways, uh, ease yourself in, and then swing your legs in one at a time. That's probably an easier position for most people uh, than just trying to sort of slide in whilst putting a foot in simultaneously. So we're talking about exiting the vehicle backwards, same rules apply. We want to maintain three points of contact at all times. We want to use the runner or steps when we're climbing down to the ground. There's typically, uh, this is typically for work type vehicles or for larger recreational vehicles. You may find, or you often find that there's like a running board or a step or something that's designed to help you come down from that vehicle. So if you have a grab bar like this gentleman in the picture does, then you want to use that grab bar, not the steering wheel when you're trying to climb out. And you're, again, you're bending at the hips and the knees and trying to keep that back as straight as possible during your during exiting the vehicle. You want to keep your both hands on the vehicle until you are securely on the ground and upright. So at least two of your points of contact in this position are going to be your hands typically. And then one of your feet is going to be moving at any given time. Now, you're typically not going to use this, uh, as I'm sure you can imagine, if you have a low to the ground vehicle. This is going to be best suited for folks who are in taller vehicles trying to exit something like a work vehicle or a tall recreational vehicle. One of the major risk factors as well, depending on the type of work that you do or your employees do, is loading and unloading the vehicle uh, when you're climbing in and out, or not when you're climbing in and out, excuse me, when you actually get to your location and you have to perhaps pull some equipment or uh, boxes and delivery items out of the vehicle. So we're going to talk about some ways to do that more safely. So number one, you always want to practice safe lifting guidelines. If you aren't familiar what those are, we're not going to go into them today. You can search that online and find lots of great references to help describe that for you. You never want to reach into the passenger seat or the back seat while you're in the driver's seat. Um, and you certainly uh, want to make sure that you're getting out and going around to those uh, to those the most appropriate door. So if there's an item stored on the passenger seat, obviously go around there. If it's stored on the back left uh, seat, you want to come through from that side, from that door and accessing your equipment and items that way. Trunk storage nets, if you have those, can be good useful tools to help keep objects at the front of the trunk. So if your trunk isn't very full, then you're not going to have objects sliding around so that when you go to get them out later, they're at the very back edge and they're harder to get to. So you can use those to actually keep things at the front. And you want to actually climb into the truck bed or the van in order to move objects from the front edge to the front edge before you lift them. So if you're driving a larger vehicle and things have shifted or are stored further back in the vehicle, don't stand at the very front uh, or like with your feet against the, the bumper and try and reach into the back. Actually climb into that vehicle, push them forwards to the edge and then try and retrieve them or lift them out of the vehicle. Some different methods you might consider is one knee on or in a vehicle, like this gentleman here. This person is putting one knee on the bumper, and this is if an object is stored or is positioned further back in the car. So if it gets further back in the trunk, you want to put one knee on the bumper to slide that object towards you or to lift it out of the trunk if it's too big to even slide. Um, and in this case, you can see how great that back posture is, right? They're maintaining a really great, nice straight back posture. They've got three points of contact uh, as best as possible, right? They've got one foot, one knee and then likely one hand or arm can also be used to support them. Uh, and you're going to slide that object towards you and then you're going to lift it out of the vehicle, right? So you want to, you can use that uh, to your advantage if things are further away from you. So instead of keeping your feet on the floor and just leaning into the car, you're actually going to move further into the vehicle by putting your knee up. You'll be able to get a bit closer and that will reduce the amount of reaching and awkward back postures you're putting yourself in. 
You might also use a both feet on the ground posture. And in this case, you want to get as close to the vehicle. You can see in the picture here, uh, this gentleman actually has his feet right up against, or excuse me, his knees right up against the bumper. And that's pretty much ideal. That's as close as you can get. You can see how fabulous uh, the back posture is that he's maintaining. You want to bend your knees and your hips and keep that nice straight back. The real trick uh, for safe lifting guidelines, if that's something that applies to you, as well as for both of these lifting postures here, is that in order to achieve that straight back, back posture, you really need to focus on two things. If you can keep these in mind, you're going to find that you have good back posture through almost every lift. And so the two things to remember are to stick your bum out and to stick your chest out. If you're sticking your chest and your bum out simultaneously, you pretty much will find that you have a nice straight back position. So that can really improve your posture just by sticking your bottom and your uh, and your chest out simultaneously you'll get that good position so now if you are looking at preventative measures right you want to actually improve the the workplace let's say you're an employer you want to improve the workplace for your employees or you're an employee who's trying to improve or reduce their discomfort in the vehicle so from an employer perspective, you want to work on or you might want to consider safe driving techniques training. Although this seems like common sense, many, many people don't properly adjust their vehicles. If you're driving home today, uh, when you get a chance, take a peek at people around you. You'll see all kinds of different seated positions and you'll know pretty quickly that some of those are not good, right? So safe driving techniques sound simple, but it is not intuitive. Not everyone knows how to properly adjust their vehicle. So if you can teach them how to do that, then that you can probably reduce your injury risk that way. You also could consider regular vehicle maintenance. It, this is an important feature. It reduces vibration. If you have proper alignment, good tire pressure, etc., you're going to have uh, so, uh, basically someone safer in the vehicle because they can actually achieve better posture and they're reducing that vibration exposure. If you're at the point where you are choosing fleet vehicles, right, so you're trying to replace some of the vehicles in your fleet or looking at seat replacement on a truck or something, you may want to look at uh, or consider different features on those vehicles. So look at chairs that have or seats that have good back support. Think about the different adjustment features. Not all adjustments are standard. So look at vehicles that have additional adjustment features. It will give you a better, a better setup for your employees to be able to achieve good fit in the vehicle, right? The more adjustment features in theory, uh, the better the fit that can be achieved in a vehicle. And now this, you want to obviously consider also how the vehicle is going to be used. So we're using it for transportation of goods purposes. Is it just going to be a person in the vehicle? Are there going to be more than one person in the vehicle, right? You want to consider all those features and consider how that impacts the ergonomic setup of a vehicle. Now, if you're an employee or an individual who spends a lot of time in their vehicle, you may be wondering how what you can do to prevent some of these issues. And probably the number one is sit with proper postures that actually figure out how to properly adjust your vehicle and sit with good posture, getting good lower back support in your vehicle. And then you want to make sure you adjust all your vehicle features. And it's not like you have to get once you adjust your vehicle features, you're not married to that forever, right? Taking a few minutes to make some minor adjustments to your seat during the drive or after a break can actually change the postures and the loading of those muscles, which can actually decrease some of the fatigue. So taking a moment to raise your chair up one additional notch or change the angle of the backrest slightly can actually change the blood flow and the loading of those muscles. So it can be a good thing to change your postures regularly through vehicle seat adjustments. Obviously, you want to pay attention to safely exiting and entering the vehicle. You want to pay attention to safe lifting items in and out of the vehicle. And ideally, you can take frequent breaks and maybe even stretch during those breaks. So if you know you're going to be driving for a long period of time, uh, make sure that you schedule breaks every hour, hour and a half. Give yourself an opportunity to get out of the vehicle and assume a non-seated position. And obviously, you're also going to eliminate the vibration component. If the vehicle stopped, there's no vibration. So that's going to help your risk too.